and it would be quite nice if we fixed it sooner rather than later, then start to tell other people about it. Start to evangelize. Get the word out that this is not science fiction, it's not bad, it's not unnatural, it's not crazy, it's the future. And the sooner it comes, the better. And don't let people change the subject, because most people find it very uncomfortable to talk about this. But ultimately, it's only by making people uncomfortable that we will change their minds. So I will stop there. Thank you. OK. Oh, Aubrey, thank you kindly for coming and speaking at the forum. Uh, I'm afraid we've only got about five or ten minutes for question and answer. If anyone's got any questions, please put your hand up. And uh, I'll take the, take the mic out to you, or if you can project. Social level, then, is scientific. Yeah, yeah, I had that. Yeah, um, it's basically about how this is going to benefit human mankind. Um, on a general level, so how are you going to make it affordable to develop? All right, so, all right, so very important question. Um, maybe I should have the microphone because I'm being recorded. Should I have them? Oh, no, no, my microphone's working. It's safe, no problem. Um, yeah, OK, so the question is, how are we going to make sure everybody gets all this? Because actually, you know, people are a bit worried about that because at the moment, a lot of expensive medicines are only available to, uh, to, the, to the wealthy. That's a bad thing. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that at all in this case, and it's for a very simple reason. It's more expensive to let people get sick the way they do today than what it will be to stop people from getting sick using these medicines. These medicines will certainly be very expensive at first, though, of course, like any new technology, they will get cheaper. But even at the beginning, they are going to be completely easy to, easy to justify from the point of view of provision at, uh, free at the point of delivery, even in completely tax-averse countries like the USA, simply because of the money that will be saved. Really, the correct analogy for today's world is basic education, which every wealthy country provides, of course, for free, simply because if they didn't, they would be economically neutered 20 years down the road. Is it not an issue that it's not the money that's being saved, but it's the money that's not being made by the pharmaceutical companies, etc.? All right, so the, if, you went, if we go into details about how the economic mechanics of this will work, there are several issues. First one is we won't be spending money on the um, diseases of old age, and the um, point that was just made was, hang on, Surely, big pharmaceutical industries make their money from people who are sick. And in particular, that means people who are old and sick. Um, and that's true, but those same companies know damn well that they can make money out of the same medicines that I'm talking about. And in fact, that's already happening. Yeah. The main business model that has existed historically for big pharma is called the blockbuster drug model, where they just try and you know, look at 10 million different substances for their effect on such and such a thing, and they find the occasional jackpot, and that's how they keep going. That model is breaking. In fact, it has completely broken, largely due to gradually increasing difficulty or, and, and simple time of the drug approval process. And the result is that Big Pharma is already moving very heavily into regenerative medicine. Not regenerative medicine for aging yet, because it's not there yet, but definitely they are getting the right amount of expertise, which means that when this medicine does come into existence, they will be perfectly positioned to make money just as they do today. So that's not a problem. Another part of the problem comes from, well, hang on, um, we're going to have to apply these medicines periodically. That's why Big Pharma is going to carry on making money, right? So surely, in the end, people are going to have expended more money on their medical care than what they would in this relatively short amount of time when they were really sick in today's world. That's true, but it also doesn't matter because the people who are staying healthy and not getting sick are going not simply to be failing to consume medical resources, they're also going to be contributing wealth to society as time goes on, staying in the workforce or in more informal ways contributing wealth. So we're definitely looking at an economic no-brainer. I have no idea who to take next. From the front. Go on. Hi. Uh, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but how will it impact upon population expansion? I do indeed get this all the time. Well, as I, <clears throat> as I tried to explain, the demographic shifts in the population are going to be slow. It's going to be a very long time before that happens, because people only get one year older one year at a time. And the biggest thing we have to remember is that quite a lot of other things are happening in the world, are changing in the world all the time too, and most of them are happening much more quickly. You know, how many people remember not having a cell phone? Right? I thought you might. I thought you might. It wasn't terribly long ago. Right. So, so, so I mean, the fact is, things, technology changes the world enormously fast. Now, one thing that we have to take into account in predicting what's going to happen here is what's already happening with the birth rate. Obviously, I'm sure you all know that 
the average woman in every single country that, that achieves a level of prosperity that allows female education and female emancipation um, exhibits a rapid reduction in the birth rate, which continues and is continuing throughout the industrialized world, and it's happening very fast in the pre-industrialized world, such as India. Um, now, what that means in terms of where we'll be once the survival of people who are currently dying of old age becomes a significant number, uh, we can't really say. We just don't know what the rates are going to be, but they may very well be enough, especially if we take into account the fact that when we don't have menopause anymore, because that's one thing we're going to fix, um, women will be able to postpone having their first child until well, for another decade and another decade. That's already happening now, of course, up to the point where it's then or never. That won't be true anymore. Um, however, the big thing I want to say is it's not a matter of predict predicting the chances of which of these scenarios will happen. What we have to ask ourselves from a moral point of view, from a point of view of simple you know, imperative, is who's entitled to make this choice? Supposing we did get into a situation where it was actually quite important to lower the birth rate lower than what we would like in order to, keep, to make enough room to keep the older people around. So what? The fact is, it's the choice that humanity of that generation should be entitled to make between the low birth rate or the high death rate. It's not a choice that we have any right to make on behalf of the, the humanity of the future. We have a moral obligation to develop these therapies so to give that choice to people who have the entitlement to make it, rather than condemning the future to an unnecessarily painful and early death. Go ahead. So, it seems like you're the inheritor of like the uh, Enlightenment project and everything. But, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one from like 20 uh, people who uh, came, came to listen to you. And the, you know, the, the rest of them believe in you know, women's rights and gay rights and everything like this. But you know, the, the, the whole science thing seems to really sort of uh, you know, have people confused. They, 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 they think that, it, you know, I don't know secret garden party ethos you sort of feel like they don't really like scientists and they you know they don't really understand what you're doing is, is part of your problem really public relations i think sort of that, i think that most of the problem that we have in trying to explain the justification of this work is indeed public relations part of it may be people just don't like to think about science but you know too bad this is why you wouldn't have computers and cell phones if we didn't have science right um, however, part of it is also that people just don't like to think about ageing. You've all made your peace with ageing. You don't want to think about it. And I'm making you think about it again. Um, well, hello. It's, it's a moral obligation to do so. Um, I, I don't know whether we've got any more time. Yeah, I'm afraid we're going to have to... Uh, oh, but I, have to but what I'll do is I'll, I'll hang around immediately outside. So if anyone wants to ask more questions, then I'm, I'm going to be there. All right? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Aubrey. <laughs> Thank you.